Good evening, we're gonna go ahead and get started. I'm Christine Brancolini, Dean of the Library. Welcome to the beautiful Vonderaw Family Suite and the William H. Hannon Library on the campus of Loyola Marymount University. I know that we all know where we are, but we're recording and somebody may see this video and not know where we're located and we don't want there to be any questions. I'm delighted to see all of you tonight for the opening of the spring 2022 exhibition Beneath the Banner of the Cross, the global vision of the early Jesuits. In the time of COVID, we are never certain if in-person events will be possible, and yet here we are. I am grateful for the opportunity to gather with all of you this evening to explore the exhibition in Archives and Special Collections and to learn more about it from the presentations to come. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Cynthia Beck, Head of Archives and Special Collections. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, I'm here to give a very brief introduction to how this um, exhibit came to be in its early stages. And so my, my introduction is peppered with thanks because over the years, it took many, many people helping. And I want to start with thanking Dean Chris Francolini for her enthusiastic support of all of Special Collections um, ideas and growth. And that includes the uh, creation of the recognition of the, the canonization anniversary. So thank you, Chris. Um, so as part of the quick backstory, it was almost 12 years ago, right when we moved into Hannon Library thereabouts, when it dawned on me that 2022 was going to be the 400th anniversary of the canonization of Ignatius of Loyola and Francis Xavier. So it was way back then that I started seeking rare books and documents to add to the collection that would recognize and respond to that super important um, event in Jesuit history. So in 2010, we acquired a 1609 publication of Pope Paul V's bull decreeing the beatification of Loyola. And that acquisition kicked off many years of carefully looking for and building up the collection with the goal always in mind that come 2022, we would end up with some kind of exhibition. Uh, so again, 12 years to do this. Many of the objects selected by the student curators and displayed in this exhibit came to LMU as part of that goal-oriented collecting, I'm so happy to say. So at this point, I have to stop and give my, my second thanks, and these are very important, and my thanks goes to the Jesuit community because adding such historically significant and rare material to the library collection would never have been possible without the LMU Jesuit communities, generous support through gifts to the Jesuit Rare Book Fund that Father Michael Eng established in 1996, and which continued to be supported through decades by subsequent rectors of the community. So my, my deepest Thanks and heartfelt because you have helped us provide an extraordinary collection to LME students for learning and to our, our wider research community. The exhibition idea also evolved over the years. All along in Hannon Library, um, the team in Archives and Special Collections um, was experimenting and exploring different ways to present exhibitions in our lovely little gallery. And um, we began to create partnerships with faculty. I'm so pleased to see Carla Biddle here because she launched the class curated era um, back in 2015 with us, um, where we partnered with faculty to create a course that would help to, and would include the teaching of um, exhibition research and curatorial skills to students all through the framework of that faculty member's course's specific disciplinary lens and um, the themes that the course was going to explore. And those have become among my most favorite exhibits. I absolutely love seeing um, in the gallery uh, the exhibits illuminating our students' thoughtful voices and also spotlighting the wonderfully creative teaching that goes on on this campus. It's such an LMU thing to to be really creative. I've really loved how these courses can actually come about and, and showcase what it is that we do that's so special academically. And it really also puts our library's historical collection 
to work for a full semester, deeply engaging with students and the curriculum. So for me, this exhibit um, celebrates LMU learning. So in transitioning our evening to the main event, I cannot express enough gratitude to Professor Amy Wisson Bolton, um, who accepted our, I wanna say invitation, but it was like a plea at that <laughs> stage to be special collections faculty partner in crime for the 2022 canonization anniversary exhibition. She valiantly did so in the midst of and in tune with tumultuous years of pandemic and societal reckoning. I was honored to participate in her beautifully crafted fall semester course, Exhibiting Sainthood, where it was a joy to get to know and work with her fabulous students who analyzed, discussed, and considered over 70 rare books and documents. That's a new class record, um, which they then distilled somehow miraculously into their final selections, but they were up to the challenge. I also want to give thanks to my special collections colleague, Jessica Guardado, who served as the lead designer to realize the class curator's visit, vision, visiting and presenting to the class several times to help guide the final process. And you will also note when you see the exhibit that there are two objects in it that are not part of the library collection. So um, once again, I wanna thank Father Eng um, for lending us his 1622 medallion commemorating the canonization and for arranging the loan of a second medallion from LMU alumnus, Matthew Parlow, now executive vice president of Chapman University, whom we also thank for having an object on display. So what you see in the gallery, when you see all these materials, they're, they're wonderful, but it really represents a huge collaborative, collaborative effort to get this done. Um, so many people involved, including our own work-study student assistants who joined team exhibit to make sure it got done on time. And I wanna give a special shout out to Elizabeth Drummond as well, because she was the faculty member we originally floated the idea by and she gently steered me toward Amy. And I'm so grateful for that as well. Thank you, Elizabeth, for, for showing us the way. Um, so just to wrap up, after so many years of my imagining what our collections could do to mark the 400th anniversary of Loyola and Xavier's canonization, and what the resulting exhibition would say and look like, I am thrilled with the results. And now that the dust has settled, I can't wait to hear what some of the co-creators um, have reflected on and think about their journey. So without further ado, please joining me, join me in thanking Amy Whitson Bolton for investing so much of her time and care to our partnership, for her scholarly leadership and expert community building throughout the course and weeks beyond that. Welcome, Amy. My goodness, thank you so much. Um, Cynthia is a joy. Well, this is just gonna be a mutual appreciation <laughs> event in case you didn't know. Cynthia is always a joy to work with and um, having the kind of, uh, I mean, to, to, to have the kind of collections that we do for our size university is just, it, it's, it really is extraordinary. Um, I'm always thrilled to be able to work with Cynthia and with the library, um, but the chance to put on an exhibition in the gallery, I think especially after teaching online for so long, work with actual physical objects and to curate for an actual physical gallery was amazing for myself and the students. Um, but before I say a few words um, about the project to introduce the students presentation, I want to start with the land acknowledgement that the students wrote for this exhibition. The Loyola Marymount University community recognizes that the university sits on the ancestral and unceded land of the Gabrielino Tongva people. Their land was stolen by Spaniards, Mexicans, and Americans over a period of many years. Through this land acknowledgement, LMU intends to address the injustices of colonialism, acknowledge the atrocities that uh, Gabrielino Tongva people have endured over the years, and uplift the sovereignty of indigenous communities locally and globally. The history and legacy of the Jesuit order is strongly linked to that of colonialism as this exhibit seeks to demonstrate. 
And that's a little snippet, I think, of how thoughtfully the students are approaching and this complex work. I designed the Exhibiting Sainthood course so that the students could have three key experiences last semester. Study multiple early modern books up close and personal. Engage with the historical background of the early modern world so they could understand better what those objects meant. And think carefully about what it would mean to interpret those objects for the public. After they met the huge range of objects, I guess 70 record-breaking number of objects, and did extensive reading about Jesuits and the period, they wrote historical background papers, researched and presented their findings on their individual objects, and read about, of course, public history. These are not easy texts. Most of them are in Latin. And the questions around how to present Jesuit and early modern colonial history are complex. How do we think about how these issues taking both the Jesuits' goals and indigenous experiences into account? How do we grapple with a historical record that gives us the European perspective, but not that of the people they colonized? Like most collections and archives, this set of objects is full of erasures and silences. How do you present an absence? Grappling with strange texts in Latin and the difficulties of doing public history, by the last weeks of class, they put all that preparation into action. They worked on their object labels and worked in groups to put the exhibition together, room design, introductory texts, audio guide, and social media. Obviously, social media is a that's the key part now, right? We chose the title together and library just, uh, designer Jessica Guardado, who's a miracle worker, worked with us to create the wonderful wall image you see in the gallery. But throughout this process, and one of the things that is thrilling and a little, actually a lot terrifying about this kind of teaching, none of us knew what was going to emerge out of all this work. The same syllabus with a different group of students would produce a very different exhibition because they would have chosen different objects, a different title, different images, and different points of emphasis. And that is actually the beautiful thing about it. I think what I am most proud of is that even while the class held a wide range of views about how to approach this topic, they worked together to curate an exhibition that shows the complexity and contradictions of the period. We tried to approach this exhibition marking 400 years since the canonization of Saints Ignatius of Loyola and Francis Xavier by trying to understand their goals, the context in which they worked, and the many intended and unintended consequences of their actions. It was surprising to all of us to really grasp the scope of the Jesuit project. From the very beginning, as you'll see, the Society of Jesus worked in the early modern world on a truly global scale, working both for and against colonial powers and forming a crucial network to collect, share, and display knowledge about the non-European world. All of those elements were part of the society from the very beginning, a new kind of Catholic order without a monastery the Jesuits aim to build only colleges and universities to stay connected through the spiritual exercises and invited their memories to work around the world in the words of their formula as a soldier of God beneath the banner of the cross. Living as we do on Gabrielino Tongva land in a settler colonial nation built on the dispossession of indigenous people and a racialized slave system, and here in this Jesuit and Marymount University that continues to expand and reanimate those missions, we live in all the contradictions and unexpected consequences of the world that the Jesuits helped to build. It was thrilling to work with students around and through that process. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Emma and then Maddie and then Michael. So Emma Balda, take it away. Um, so I'm Emma, and I was a I am a senior who is in Professor Woodson Bolton's um, exhibiting sainthood class. I have been in a few um, public history classes where I was able to work with special collections and help curate and exhibit with the class. Um, however, even though I'm a senior at LMU, I was really unfamiliar with 
Jesuit history and their legacy. So it was really interesting to apply my past knowledge of curatorial skills and museum studies to this new material. Um, throughout the course of the class, we seemed to kind of follow this theme of a paradox that Professor Woodson kind of just touched on um, in the Jesuit attitude. So they were really engaging with these um, indigenous cultures that they interacted with, um, very accommodating to them, learning their language, learning their traditions, their customs. Um, but at the same time, they were ultimately trying to convert and evangelize them. So there's this interesting juxtaposition in they're trying to learn about these people, but they're also trying to erase their cultures. Um, so I personally looked at Matthias Tanner's Martyrology, which covered and illustrated um, Jesuit missionary efforts in Africa, Asia, the Americas, and Europe. Um, it, to me, it seemed like a tool that was used by Tanner to really glorify the sacrificial nature of these missionary efforts. They're very graphic, detailed, and violent engravings. So it's really demonstrating just what the, the lengths to which the Jesuits were willing to go to spread their message. Um, at the same time, I think it serves as a way for the Jesuits to teach those at home who were reading this what the non-Westerners were like. It served as a point of reference for the old world to introduce the new world to those at home. And I think that can be really problematic when you take into, the, take into account that these were really violent engravings. And so it has these negative connotations and can paint them in a really harsh light. But at the same time, the Jesuits did a lot of um, spread so like spread education and really push forward this accommodation. And I think that's also important to note. So I think my key points, key takeaways from this exhibit has been just witnessing the global force that the Jesuits were, but also the importance of noting that this force is really nuanced and complicated. And I hope that echoes in the exhibit. Thank you. Oh, <clears throat> good evening, everyone. Uh, so thank you all for coming out tonight for our opening of Beneath the Banner of the Cross. My name is Maddie Deal. I was one of the students who helped curate this exhibit. Uh, tonight, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Jesuit history and the ideology that sort of guided us in our curatorial efforts. Uh, as we've already heard from my fellow classmate and Professor Wilson Bolton, one of our big overarching themes was exploring all of the nuance of the Jesuit group. So throughout this uh, exhibit, you're going to see objects that fit into three broad, overarching, interconnected categories. The Reformation context in which the Jesuit order was born, uh, the intellectual nature of the Jesuit order, which has been there since the very beginning, and of course, as we've touched on already, uh, the link between the Jesuits and colonialism, which is where my object fits in. My object is a drawn depiction of a Jesuit missionary in India. Uh, it comes from a book that depicts the Jesuit orders at the beginning of the 18th century, which were a very large number. Uh, however, throughout the book, each group is represented by only one image, with the exception of the Jesuits. There are about 10 of them. And this is because of the Jesuit practice of accommodation. When the Jesuits would form a mission in a foreign country, they would emulate some of the local customs of that place, including styles of dress. So the way the Jesuits dressed, the way that they presented themselves, differed fairly dramatically depending on where they were. So mine is from India, but there's also one in there from China. Um, Japan, they dress differently, all of these other places. And of course, Europe, they had their own way of doing so as well. Um, through seeing the diversity of the way that they're dressed, we get insight into the global reach of the Jesuits, just how many missions they had, how far their reach was, but also get some insight into the complicated relationship that they had with the people they were trying to convert. So on the one hand, accommodation represents a high level of respect held by the Jesuits for potential converts, especially compared to that of their secular colonial contemporaries. Along with relatively superficial articulations, like how they were dressed, they learned the local language and local religion customs and incorporated a lot of those things into the way that they presented themselves to the local population. Uh, they firmly believed that Catholicism had to be adopted voluntarily and not a forced coercion. Uh, they saw it as their burden and their duty to translate Jesuit values and uh, ideology in a way that made sense, both literally and figuratively changing the language. Uh, 
they perceived of their potential converts as fully human and possessing civilizations that were worth understanding and accommodating to. This was fairly unusual during the colonial period and often brought the Jesuits into conflict with colonial powers. Consequently, the order was banned throughout Western Europe and most of the colonial world starting in the mid 1700s. The controversial accommodation policy was the tip of the iceberg of the Jesuit dedication to serving a global community, regardless of race or ethnicity. The Jesuits were known to fight for the rights and dignity of the people that they were trying to convert. Uh, and this forms the modern, modern day Jesuits' uh, dedication to social justice and emphasis on that policy. On the other hand, accommodation reflects a paternalistic, racialized misunderstanding of foreign culture. The Jesuits firmly believed that their religion and the westernized culture associated with it were unquestionably superior to the people that they were trying to convert. This attitude was not unusual at the time period, but it is worth noting in the context of accommodation. Accommodation was not born out of respect for these cultures, these people, or these traditions, but a desire to change them. The end goal was conversion and westernization. Also worth noting is that accommodation was not practiced by all Jesuits in all situations, but only in those missions in East Asia. Europeans had long been in, in contact with Eastern civilizations and had a somewhat grudging respect of them. They recognized various aspects of Asian culture, like written language, cultural hierarchy, and centralized government. Therefore, they saw these people as civilized. They still saw that civilization as backwards and in need of their help through conversion to Catholicism, but it was a civilization. In Africa and the Americas, however, the Jesuits failed to recognize the legitimacy of the social orders that they encountered. Conversion efforts there were a lot less accommodating and more closely aligned with brutalist colonial racism. For example, many Jesuits in the Americas owned slaves as a way to finance their mission. Accommodation was an insulting means a colonial end, and it only applied to those people that the Jesuits viewed as possessing civilization and acknowledged as fully human. So which is it? Were the Jesuits humanitarian guides who held their congregations in high regard and fought back against the worst elements of colonialism? Or were they smugly superior instruments of a deeply racist and violent colonial system? The answer is both. The history and legacy of the Jesuit order is incredibly complicated. Addressing this history and its legacy is not simple. It has no clear answers or simple resources. But admitting the truth about this history is an essential first step. One thing that I've particularly appreciated throughout this whole experience has been the openness of the university and the Jesuit order here on campus to allow us to ask these hard questions. I've been somewhat concerned that we might face pressure to present Jesuit history in a more complimentary light or gloss over some of its uglier aspects especially as the university is part of the 400th anniversary celebration of the canonization of St. Ignatius Loyola, who's the founder of the Jesuit order and namesake of the university. But I was pleased to encounter a willingness and in fact an eagerness to tell this history as it is. We study history not to unilaterally celebrate or condemn, but to learn. We study history to understand the world that we live in today and what we can and should do moving forward. I hope you find this exhibit illuminating and thought provoking. I hope it encourages you to sorry. I hope it encourages you to ask big questions about the legacies of colonialism and the role of religion. Most of all, I hope it helps you see why I believe that understanding and addressing the past is the only way to move forward. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me all right. Uh, my name is sorry, closer to the mic. Sounds good. Um, uh, my name is Michael Nacy. I'm a junior history major, a screenwriting minor here at LMU, uh, and I'm very happy to be here tonight. I work downstairs at the uh, collections management department as a student assistant, and so I've been able to spy a little bit on this exhibition coming together all the artifacts being brought in and the uh, wall being put up, but it's more than a little surreal to be here <laughs> at the end of this process in front of you all. And I'm very, very appreciative that you're all here tonight. Uh, so my object that I worked on for this <coughs> exhibition was a papal bull written by Pope Gregory the 13th, who I believe uh, came up with the Gregorian calendar. 
and it was written in 1579. So this was when the Jesuits were already in process of their global expansion, but it helped that global expansion become more effective, more efficient, and that it removed some bureaucratic hurdles that the Jesuits faced before this point. Uh, before this point, the Jesuits would have had to submit a notice to Rome to found new, uh, new ministries, new churches, wherever they went. With this papal bull, that process stopped and the Jesuits could expand further and faster. So this caused the Jesuits to expand into New Spain, New France, and ultimately led to the process through which this university was created. And um, this whole process and this class has got me thinking about the Jesuits in my personal history. Uh, I went to a Jesuit high school. Obviously, I'm here now. Once I've graduated, that's going to be eight years, not four years, at a Jesuit institution. And during high school, the Jesuits were sort of a, not mysterious, but elusive presence. I didn't know a lot about them. I was always curious, and I always had sort of an, un, an unbounded surprising effect on me. In senior year of my uh, high school experience, I was a, a Kairos retreat leader. Uh, and before going on this retreat to the Santa Cruz Mountains, my fellow Kairos retreat leaders and the faculty going to this retreat were invited into a chapel inside the building where the Jesuits had their offices. And I'd pass this building every day on the walk into school. And to go into this chapel that we were invited into, seeing this whole setup, it looked like something that could have been filmed for the uh, Aretha Franklin documentary that came out a few years ago, Amazing Grace. And it was utterly incredible to see that and to be in that space 10 feet from where I walked to school every day. And so that got me thinking about all of the details that I've been lucky enough to experience in my high school and here because of the Jesuits. Uh, the first of those is that I've been lucky enough not to just walk past the chapel every day and see it as another beautiful building on campus. Uh, in my freshman year at the end of orientation weekend, uh, my parents and I got to hear a prayer that was said on the end of my uh, mother's uh, high school experience and kicked off my experience here. Uh, I was lucky enough not to walk past the Berlin Wall piece on campus and see it as just another part of the campus that has been put there for a ceremonial purpose I don't completely understand. I was lucky enough to take Professor Drummond's uh, Cold War history class. It's good to see you, by the way. Um, and learn about the context of that. And finally, I was lucky enough not to miss out on all these artifacts that the library holds. And I was utterly stunned by the, the 70 artifacts that we saw. Um, and to work with them to pick one out and to deeply understand the context through which it was written and through which we are now presenting it. Um, and so I'd like to, uh, as we're presenting this exhibition and focusing on Jesuit history in both a critical and a celebratory light, I wanna focus on the celebration uh, and say that it's easy to overlook all these details and it's easy not to be lucky enough to experience them. Unfortunately, I was, but for those who aren't, it's also easy to take that extra step and to be aware of the history and aware of the traditions that we have here. And I'd like to congratulate each and every person here for taking that easy step and being a little bit more aware of Jesuit history and its place on this campus. So thank you. Um, although make sure it's a question and not just a comment. <laughs> Actually, comment comments are fine too. Yeah. Um, first of all, congratulations to all of you. Um, you've done a fabulous job. Absolutely beautiful. But I would like to know, so a lot of this was in Latin. How did you approach this Latin text? And I mean, I, I can't even imagine. <laughs> Somebody want to? 
Um, well, I was lucky to go the easy route and have Cynthia give me a translation uh, for my object, which was very, very convenient. And luckily mine was pretty short. It was the papal bull. Uh, so there wasn't much translating, uh, sorry, translating I had to do. And I'm sure it was different for, for other people. Yeah, mine was entirely in Latin. I pretty much just used Google Translate, honestly, um, and like did the best I could with that. Uh, but I also had a lot of pictures. It was a majority of pictures. So I was really lucky with that. Uh, most of my research was based off of that. I didn't have to rely as heavily on the text, um, but I remember I, I did use Google Translate for the certain um, images that I looked at. And then while we were uh, while we were looking at the artifacts each week, if I wanted to look at something, I would try and use um, Google Translate. But I think that like a lot of us use Google Translate. Yeah, just basically the same thing that Emma said. Um, mine was an image that also came with a text description. So I just went through one night, put the whole thing into Google Translate. Um, and it, you know, it's a little rocky, but it gets you close enough to understand it. And uh, an image is worth a thousand words. So, anybody else? Thank you, Professor. So, congratulations, Amy, Maddie, Michael, Emma. I'm very proud of you guys. And then, and Maddie, it's good to see you finally in person. <laughs> um, so, I think I only saw you on Zoom for for a whole semester. Um, I have a question about sort of a uh, challenging how your work in of historical research, so deep historical research that you've done around these artifacts, how that has challenged um, what we might call more popular or public representations of a history, right? So uh, I went to a Jesuit university as well, um, and I'm well familiar with the kind of self-history that is often told at those universities about the, the history of the Jesuits. And it it does tend to be a rather celebratory one, right? Um, and it's a it's a it's a story, a historical narrative that undergirds the present day mission um, that we talk about in terms of Jesuit education. How has your study and and this embrace of complexity and contradictions and um, all the nuances uh, and all the difficulties and challenges in that history? How has that perhaps led you to not question, but again, complicate um, some of the stories that we tell today and to think perhaps, again, not to, not to reject, but to think more critically about how we talk about um, the mission of Jesuit higher education today? I hope that question made sense. She asked that pretty nice to the vice president of the <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I personally like love complicated narratives. I think that's what makes history really interesting. And so I feel like whenever I go into a history class, I almost try and complicate the narrative just because I know that there is like another side to the story. Um, and I think that's what's made this, um, exhibit and the past exhibits I've been in so interesting is because I find it really fascinating to be presented with these celebratory narratives and to kind of take a step back and say like, where are the marginalized voices in this? And I think that's something that's um, really important is when you're given this platform to kind of honor that privilege that you're given and um, share the narrative with those who have historically been oppressed and not been given that platform. And that often does really complicate the narrative, but I think that's something that is good to embrace and um, pushes us forward. I'll say at first, it was very overwhelming to, uh, I think for a lot of us to figure out how to display these conflicting narratives together. And we talked a lot about that and it took a lot of planning to reach an equilibrium point. Um, but just from the point of view of studying it, it was so interesting to see these two sides together and sort of parse uh, how they impacted each other and how they came to be. Uh, and I hope this is answering the question, but at least for me, it's helped to see these complicated narratives and bring those 
into other fields to understand issues today, to understand issues in other classes. And ultimately, like you said, just to understand education better, that every decision that, that we make uh, in some ways is a complicated one, and that it's a very, very important skill to be able to see all the positive and negative uh, aspects of whatever we do. Um, so I hope that helped, hope that answered it. Yeah, so uh, I went to a secular public high school and I'm not Catholic. So LMU was sort of my first exposure and experience with the Jesuits. Um, and I learned about the Pope actually in your uh, modern European history class. Um, like I knew that they existed, but that was the first time I actually learned about them in a meaningful way. Um, so it was really interesting for me to, be, to sort of get a deep dive onto their history. Um, they're a really, really interesting group with a lot of conflicting opinions and diversity within them. Um, and we tend to, at this moment of racial reckoning in our society, deal with colonialism in a very one size fits all, one color, one dimension sort of way, unilaterally condemning it, um, which is you know, not necessarily a bad thing, but to sort of study the Jesuits as both a part of that system and a fighting against that system was just really fascinating to me, which is why I gravitated toward the object that I picked, um, that there is so much complexity there. And that's, as everyone said, my favorite thing about history is understanding that you can't make it one size fits all. When people talk about history, they way oversimplify. Um, and the complexity and that detail is what makes life so beautiful and the discipline so important. So this class has been fantastic for that. We're recording this for the history promotional material, right? <laughs> Thank you, and, and congratulations to all of you on this uh, this wonderful work. It's uh, this is really terrific. Um, I, I want to pick up on a point that a couple of you have made, uh, and this follows up a little bit on Professor Drummond's uh, question. Um, you know, you've talked about being at this place um, uh, and and not really learning very much about the Jesuits until the the moment of this class, or really learning some new things and. Uh, uh, and I think you mentioned Emma that you you know you, uh, you you learned some things that you maybe wish you had known at some other point in time. And I'm wondering, uh, from a very practical uh, perspective, uh, as in fact uh, the vice president for mission and ministry, um, what it is as students that you you think uh, LMU undergraduates ought to know uh, about Jesuits as part of their four years spent here at this institution and. And how can we be better kind of communicating that story and sharing it with you? Balancing, I think, uh, what, what Michael has talked about is both the, the kind of the celebratory aspects, what, what is uh, worth noting and, and treasuring in this tradition, and also the critical aspects. What are the areas that we need to be engaging all of you and helping us uh, to think through? Careful, I think you just volunteer each for committee. <laughs> Actually, we'll start over here, sorry. Oh, yeah. Um, so I... My first impulse is, oh, make us all take a class on Jesuit history, but that seems a little dicey and like a recipe for Jesuit propaganda. So um, <laughs> I don't know, make everyone come to our exhibit. I think that's the yeah. answer. <laughs> yeah, I, I really don't know. It's um, one thing that I appreciate about LMU that drew me here as someone who's not personally Catholic is that the school, there is a Catholic presence on campus. You definitely feel it. There's an intentionality there but it's never something that's imposed on you, which was something that was very attractive to me. Um, like it's there if you want it, but no one's ever gonna force you. Like I don't feel out of place on campus as someone who's not um, a practicing Catholic. Um, so I, I really don't know what the answer is because that's one of my favorite things about LMU, but I don't know. Um, one, what Maddie said, they should come to the exhibition. Um, but also I think, that from my experience just in high school, what most of what I heard was, uh, you know, that we should be men foreign with others, go ahead and set the world af aflame. And that's important. That should not change at all. But that message does need to be added to and contextualized. Um, one of the things that we read about, I forget which reading it was because it was last semester. Um, <laughs> Uh, not that I forget everything that happens in previous semesters, uh, but it was that <laughs> it was it was that when the Jesuits arrived in new locations, most of the people there didn't differentiate them from merchants or from soldiers or from in general the imperialist forces that followed the Jesuits. 
And I think that should be pointed out. And that can be pointed out through just finding new source spaces uh, and doing what we're trying to do, which is find you know, indigenous source spaces, source spaces that come from outside the Jesuits. And I think through doing that, we can see the Jesuits in their role in furthering colonialism and furthering imperialism, but also uh, we can see the Jesuits as what, what I always saw them as in high school, which is just good role models, uh, sources of good mottos to lead life with. And even if those sources are imperfect, they can still be helpful. Um, and yeah. Um, yeah, I'm gonna echo what Maddie said. I, I, as someone who is also not a practicing Catholic, I do really appreciate how LMU doesn't impose religion onto us. But at the same time, it was really interesting to learn about the Jesuits um, in this class. And it's something that I, I now feel very grateful to have had before my time here at LMU comes to a close. And so I don't really know how to balance that like lack of imposition um, with, with learning about the Jesuits, but I do feel as if there's something to be said about like learning to contextualize um, the place that you are in and the fact that we are on a Jesuit campus, just as there's something to be said about um, acknowledging the fact that we're on Gabrielino Tongva land. So I feel like there's just, um, I think it's important to contextualize the place that you're in, but I don't know the way to do that without making it like imposing, so. Well, if any of you figures it out, <laughs> please find me, having gone to that same Jesuit institution. Or teacher of this presentation. Yeah, I have a bit of a mission history question. And California is not very old in terms of European exploitation. I'm from New York State where there's a much, hundreds of years more contact history. And it was Franciscans and then Vicentians. Why did the Jesuits show up so late? Ah. <laughs> we, we don't go into this as much as we could have actually because of the dates of the objects that the students chose. Um, but it really has to do with the suppression that I think Maddie touched on. And, and one of the things that's so fast, I mean, we could, I could go on about this, so, but, but I wanna let uh, Father Ang speak, but you know, I think one of the things that became really clear to us as we all studied this is the practice of accommodation got the Jesuits in big trouble, not so much necessarily because the papacy disagreed, but because the Jansenists used it as a wedge issue. So their own Catholic, it became this inter-Catholic um, uh, uh, point of dif difference, right? Um, and the big question was that the Jesuits were letting people in China convert while still being Confucian and engage in the Confucian ancestor worship. And Anyway, it, it gets into a really fascinating battle between Kangxi, the emperor of China and the Pope and the letters going back and forth and it's fascinating. But I think the bigger issue that we started seeing is really what happened was the rise of nation states who could not have this international network of you know, people just going across and, and, um, and really um, abrogating kingdoms and nations and, and kind of other sources of power. So the suppression was in 1773. Russia, as usual, wanted to scupper the work. So Catherine the Great allowed them to stay in her in the Polish territories. And then they started coming back in the 19th century. So that's when in the 19th century, you see a wave of uh, Jesuit colleges and universities in the new world, in the, you know, what they thought of as the new world territories. And so they came in really post suppression. Um, to kind of reinvent themselves. And it's amazing. I mean, that's one of the things I think that really came across to me is how amazing it is that they did, how rapidly they did have reinvented themselves. So, but I think our exhibition in many ways is really focused on that. That's why we're very good like the global vision of the early Jesuits because we were really telling that, that pre-suppression story. Um, I, I have no idea what time it is right now. My watch finally died in the pandemic. Never bothered to think of it. But I have a feeling that I should probably introduce Father Ang right now.
Um, so I want to introduce Father Eng, who's now Chancellor of Loyola Marymount University. He has served as Dean of our own College of Bellarmine, uh, Bellarmine College of Liberal Arts and President of Santa Clara. But I think most importantly for me, I will always remember him as the person who offered me my job here at LMU. <laughs> Um, so it is with great pleasure and gratitude that I welcome Father Eng. And obviously I made a very good decision when I offered you that job. So. It really is my pleasure to offer a few remarks here at this point of the, of the program. Uh, and to congratulate the students, those are really, really interesting questions and comments that you made. And I'm very impressed with the level of sophistication of what you've raised, uh, which is a great credit then to your professor that either guided you in this class in terms of uh, just coming into contact with a complicated history. But those of us that are historians know that most history is complicated. That's the very nature of history is sorting out, you know, what actually happened and what are the significance that's going on. So I wanna thank you uh, also too, uh, Amy, for your gracious in, in, in introduction. Um, together, you and your students have illustrated this diverse aspect of the Jesuit history uh, in this early period. Uh, and it's important for a university like us, which comes out of that Jesuit tradition of education. I do wanna take a moment and thank our dynamic Dean of Libraries here, Christine Brancolini. Um, I really appreciate your opening remarks. You've supported so many wonderful initi initiatives here at LMU. And when I went to Santa Clara, I kept saying, well, back at LMU, <laughs> their library does this. So, so the librarian really didn't particularly see me, like me to come in the doors. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the director of our Archives of Special Collections, the, the amazing Cynthia Beck. I'm glad we, we recognized her earlier today. So, it's been my good fortune to collaborate with Amy on a number of projects. And currently we're working on that inclusive history and images project, which will be a really launched next week, which is to gather the more complex history of Loyola Marymount by looking at the experience of students who come from diverse backgrounds. What has been their experience of these young people? If you came from the Latino community, if you came from the Asian communities, if, you, if you're LGBTQ, the whole variety of, of, of experiences that don't generally make it into the history textbook. So our project that Cynthia has been working on that is, can we gather the images and the stories from our alumni? What was it like to be here at LMU? And let's make this a more complicated, complex history. Um, so, in three weeks, the Jesuits and our colleagues around the world are gonna mark that 400th anniversary that Cynthia has been planning on for 12 years. That's March the, <laughs> March the 12th, 1622. And by coincidence, that overlaps with the Ignatian year, the, six, the 500th anniversary of Ignatius of Loyola going through that conversion experience from being rather a lusty soldier to a more saintly life. And all it took was a cannonball in a battle that shattered his right leg a long convalescence in the family castle, and the only two books they had in the castle, okay? <laughs> two books. Uh, one, the Vita Christi, The Life of Christ by Ludolf of Saxony, of which I found we do have translations here in our library. And then the Legenda Aurea, the golden legend of Jacobo de Varenne. These were popular medieval devotional works that had been translated into Castilian, which he could read while he was convalescing. So think about that. Books can change your life. And amazingly, we gather in a library full of books that have opened the minds to countless numbers of people over the years. Students have worked in special collections and have enjoyed the manuscripts and rare books that have delighted faculty and fellow researchers. And from my experience, I know our treasures range from the script for the movie Planet of the Apes <laughs> to this 15, 18 editions of Thomas More's Utopia when it was first published, from the first four folios of William Shakespeare's works to the first edition of the proto-feminist Mary Wollstonecraft's Vindication of the Rights of Women, 1792. 
and on to the Ichikawa collection of papers from the internment camps of World War II down to the papers of the founding Catholic families of Los Angeles. This amazing breadth and diversity of these collections reflects the enduring Jesuit interest in all facets of human knowledge. And based on his conversion experience 500 years ago, Ignatius Loyola believed that all creation reveals the handiwork of a benevolent and loving God. Human beings seek to know and experience the good, the true, and the beautiful, no matter what their culture was. And Ignatius was fascinated to send Jesuits to find out how did others experience the good, the true, and the beautiful. So he urged early Jesuits to study and to teach the sciences, history, literature, philosophy, theology, theater, music, and the arts, all in order to know God better and to know God's people better. And so Ignatius sent Jesuits throughout the world to explore God's creative handiwork in all cultures. And remember that Ignatius lived in the time of the Renaissance, this great, re in, great rebirth of interest in classical languages and classical literature. And so taking his cue from the, the, the ancient Roman writer, Terence, Ignatius believed the Latin phrase, homo sum homini nihil a me alien uto. Nothing human is foreign to me. Nothing human is foreign to me. That's the good, the bad, and the ugly, okay? The best that we can achieve and the worst that we are. He said, none of this is foreign to us. And this is what we must study. This is what we must encounter. This is not what we must understand and realize that this is the human condition in which God's spirit is at work. When I returned to LMU as a graduate student in 1985, the library had recently hired a special collections librarian, Justin Clancy, Justine Clancy. She may have been the very first special collections librarian because when she opened the vault in the old library, she found the most amazing things. There's a beautiful collection, beautiful collection of baseball cards. <laughs> there was a box of medieval medals. There are mission era church vestments. There's a Civil War soldier's diary. She found all these different kinds of things and they weren't necessarily cataloged and they weren't necessarily records that went with them. But the more she opened, the more she discovered. And I was very fortunate at the time because I was very curious about all these things that she was coming up with. So she began the professional curating and cataloging of what had been carried on so extensively was carried on extensively by her successor. That was Dr. Errol Stevens. I mentioned Errol Stevens because he was a friend of mine from the world of history. And uh, we hired Errol away from the LA County Museum of, of Natural History. And he was the one who proposed to me building a collection of works about Jesuit history and Jesuit spirituality. So the display that you see tonight, some of which uh, is, is goes back to the time when Errol was uh, here working as the director of archives and special collections. As a friend, he came to me at one point, I was rector of the Jesuit community and Errol said, you know, there's this beautiful old book on Jesuit history. And that's all it took for me to open up my wallet. <laughs> and so in the, I began then a process that we should have as the Jesuit University here in Southern California, the only Jesuit University in Southern California, we should be a center where there are materials for people to learn more about Jesuit history, the traditions of spirituality. And so this, these items, Jesuitica, uh, began uh, cover a whole wide range. And so I began putting aside money when I was, uh, was rector, then the following rector put money aside and the next rector put money aside. And so, Errol and then Cynthia have been happily spending Jesuit money for years, okay? <laughs> Very happy to spend that money. So thanks to them, we all benefit from the collection that they have built over the years that graces our library and supports the exhibition we'll see tonight. Now, some comments were made about the complications of Jesuit history. I'm gonna just go off script for one moment. Right now, I, was, I attended a webinar just last week. It's, it's a third of four webinars where the Jesuits of the United States are re-examining their history 
with the mission they established among Native peoples in the United States. And this re-examination is going on in light of understanding that what has been erased, what has been done wrong, and what uh, legacy actually remains that's been a spiritual benefit. And what I find most fascinating is this is not just Jesuits talking to Jesuits. It's not Jesuits talking to their colleagues in universities. It's Jesuits listening to Native people, Native people across the United States. And the last session we had, which was 10 days ago, between 80 and 100 people on the, on the webinar giving feedback about their experiences and their families' experiences of interacting with the Jesuits at the missions. And we know in Canada, the boarding schools where Indian children were placed, we'll know, we'll know more about that in, in, uh, in the United States, because the Jesuits opened many boarding schools. We were invited in by the leaders of the native people on the various reservations as an alternative to the federal process of taking children and transporting them off the reservation to Carlisle, Pennsylvania and to other schools. Complicated, all right, complicated. On the one hand, you're changing the culture. On the other hand, the Jesuits were invited in as an, as an alternative. It's something like Sophie's choice, okay? What do you wanna do? And so the Jesuits now listening to the native peoples having to reflect now, what does this mean to us today in our work? So what you put your fingers on in your, in your research, the, the, the students articulated, is very contemporary. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very profound conversation that's going on right now. So let me conclude or we'll never get to the reception. Um, happily, LMU faculty and the students in their classes have found a warm welcome in special collections. Nice tradition there. Students have seen the actual volumes, not the digitized or virtual images, everything from Dante to Voltaire down to the newspapers of the Black Panther Party. History lives in the William H. Hannon Library, scholarship flowers in special collections. And I think St. Ignatius must smile at this living legacy of persons continuing to seek the good, the true, and the beautiful where nothing human is foreign to us. So thank you very, very much. I just remembered that I forgot to say that there is beautiful swag. Please take um, a little plastic, um, one of these little packages, swag bags, a treat bag. But I've been told, please do not open it in the gallery. And you will understand why once you look into it. Um, also, Rhonda is furiously reminding me to please fill out the little card that is on your seat. And thank you so much, everyone, for coming.